You find that it's super distasteful, you then learn, red frogs are bad, I don't want to eat red frogs again. Uh, well, if a new color form, like a blue frog, were to pop up in that population, you have no prior experience to it, so that blue form, being initially rare, should experience disproportionately high predation pressure, thereby being weeded out of the population, thus constraining phenotypic diversity within that population. Despite these expectations of stabilizing selection in a number of groups, including the Heliconius butterflies, the dendrobatic poison frogs, and the Matilla wasps, the uh, velvet ants, we do see considerable within and among population variation in uh, signal. So the real question here, and one that has been driving my dissertation research, is why? Why do we see this variation when clearly evolutionary th theory dictates that it should not happen? Now before I go on too much further, I wanted to find some terms that I'm going to be using throughout this talk. Polymorphism and polytypism. So if we imagine a landscape that has a population of frogs on it that are all different colored, these frogs are freely interbreeding, they're exchanging alleles. This represents a single population um, that is very uh, uh, variable in color. This is intraspecific variation or polymorphism. But as we know, through stochastic processes, these populations can be subdivided. Uh, new, they, they can found new populations. They can stop exchanging alleles for, with one another. And as a result, we go from a polymorphic population to po a polytypic species that has a lot of interpopulation variation. Now, interestingly, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, the uh, polytypism is something that uh, is easily uh, explained with uh, expectations of stabilizing selection if predators stay local. So if predators are only uh, working on or preying upon these, these blue frogs, they can strain phenotypic diversity within that blue population. And while the uh, overall species is highly variable within populations at a local level, it's adhering to these evolutionary expectations. But it's really polymorphism that is uh, perplexing uh, under our expectations of stabilizing selection. And polymorphism is a likely precursor to polytypism. So going into where I went and what I did, um, we have Shoemaker right here, and I did do some research here, primarily on chickens, uh, where I looked at uh, predator avoidance and learning. But most of my research was spent abroad, um, where, uh, if you'll follow me, we'll head down to South America. I First, I'm going to stop in uh, French Guiana, where I worked on two populations of Dendrobates tinctorius, the dying poison frog. Um, and in this area, we looked at predator perceptions, toxin variation, unpalatability, and gene flow. But I wasn't content just to work on two continents, I had to add a third. Um, so I decided to go uh, all the way uh, across South America, across the Pacific, uh, to Ryan's homeland down in Australia. And uh, I went there because there's some really neat frogs there uh, called the Australian brood frogs. These are spread throughout the continent, they show a lot of variation in color. Um, and they're uh, very analogous to these neotropical poison frogs, which I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, but in specifically, I was working just north of Sydney, uh, trying to understand the consequences of this signal variation in this area. So I worked in this uh, park called Wadigans National Park, where we did uh, clay model studies to understand the consequences of known and novel signals in this area to local predators. So the general outline for my dissertation um, is Aposematic signaling has, is nicely divided into discrete categories. So chapter one is going to focus on color, chapter two is going to focus on secondary defenses, chapter three is going to focus on predators, then chapter four focuses on the whole uh, system of aposematism and throwing in gene flow as well. Now because I'm working with uh, two different popular, or two different uh, taxa, if I'm uh, dealing with Dendrobates tinctorius, you'll see this symbol. If I'm dealing with Pseudophrony, you'll see this symbol. So let's get into it. Chapter 1, Avian Learning Favors Colorful and Not Bright Signals. This was recently published in PLOS 1. So in order to understand aposematic signaling, uh, we have to recognize that these signals can be highly variable. You can have very colorful signals that you see in these frogs, or you can have high contrast signals such as in a skunk. But ultimately, we need to understand color vision in order to understand signaling. So with my highly technical diagram of a retina right here, we have uh, two different types of photoreceptor cells. We have our rods, which are light sensing cells. These essentially give us night vision. And then we have our cone cells, which are color sensing cells. As humans, we have three different types of cone cells, each which is uh, sensitive to different wavelengths of light. This allows us to see uh, the whole visible spectrum, the, this nice rainbow of colors. 
Now, you've probably heard the old trope that dogs are colorblind, and this isn't entirely true. Dogs have two types of cone cells. They can see color, but just not quite as well as we can. On the other, other end, we have birds, which have four types of cone cells. They can see colors uh, all that we can, as well as into the ultraviolet. Now, this encompasses most vision systems in uh, the animal kingdom, although there are some exceptions. Perhaps the most extreme one is that of the, ma um, the mantis shrimp which is a sex decachromat. It has uh, 16 different uh, cone cells. We're not entirely sure what all these are used for. We know that it can see the visible spectrum that we can, as well as into the UV, uh, as well as uh, perhaps more, more things. And while we're not entirely sure, there are some theories out there. So some hypothesize that it can see a thermonuclear bomb of uh, light and beauty. <laughs> But as we're dealing with colorful frogs that are terrestrial, we probably don't have to wor worry about marine invertebrates. Um, but we have to consider that these are very colorful and dichromatic predators, predators that have only two uh, cone cells, aren't going to be able to discern these uh, different colors very well. So it's likely the trichromatic, which have three cone cells, or the tetrachromatic, which have four cone cells that are important. And of those, uh, birds are the most likely candidates for driving signal diversity and eposmetic signaling. So when we go uh, through the natural world and we notice all these different signals out there, we see reds and oranges and blues and greens, uh, this begs the question of, are these signals uh, learned equally? And to test this, we used domestic chickens as a model avian predator, and we went through learning experiments. So we had uh, chicks split up into three treatments, either uh, exposed to red stripes, yellow stripes, or white stripe, uh, printed out frogs, it was put, these were put on petri dishes, and then we made them associated with an unpalatable mealworm. Mealworms were made unpalatable by soaking them in chloroquine. Chloroquine is a distasteful compound to birds, but not a harmful uh, compound to birds. We went through 10 trials, or until the birds learned to, su successfully learned to avoid the signal. And we define learning as three refusals in a row. We recorded the hesitation time and whether or not they learned and analyzed these results with a generalized linear model. So let's get into the results. So if we look at the proportion learned, we see this distribution where um, those exposed to yellow were significantly more likely to learn to avoid that signal than those exposed to white, with red being intermediate. Similarly, for hesitation time, we see that those exposed to yellow were significantly uh, hesitate significantly longer than those exposed to white, with red being intermediate. So to answer that first question, are these signals equal? No, they're not. So this uh, has a follow-up as a result. Why aren't they equal? So we can look at these signals and realize that red, white, and yellow are common throughout aquosomatic taxa, even if they're distantly related. So this suggests that perhaps there are in particular components that predators are keying in on and selecting. So we can break down these signals into the two main constituent components, hue, which uh, refers to color, and luminance, which refers to brightness. So, so if we look at this image of a frog on a log, uh, we have both hue and luminance information that we're gaining from this. We can remove the color aspect, and we see that there's still quite a bit of information that we're getting from luminance only. So this really begs the question of what are the birds keying in on? To answer this, we used uh, we got spectral reflectance data on our three phenotypes. So we see that our red stripe model peaks at about 600 nanometers in wavelength. Our yellow stripe model uh, peaks about 500, and the white stripe peaks at about 400. So these are distinctly different colors. And from these data, these reflectance curves, we can analyze them using the PAGO package in R, which stands for Package for Analysis, Visualization, and Organization of Spectral Data. And we can calculate color distance uh, measurements based on the chicken vision system. And we calculate these as just noticeable differences called JNDs. This is a real measurement, and one JND is defined as, uh, for a particular vision system, the ability of that vision system to discern two, two signals from one another, bare minimum. Now, there's been considerable debate in the literature about if this is too liberal of an estimate. So a lot of researchers today are using uh, three just noticeable differences as being uh, that threshold. If it's below three uh, just noticeable differences, they can't tell these two signals apart. If it's above it, they can. So we can calculate both the chromatic and achromatic contrast, which refer to uh, just the hue component or the brightness component, uh, uh, respectively. So if we compare white and uh, red together, we can see that the just noticeable difference is well beyond our, our threshold. Uh, same with red and yellow, and yellow and white. 
So based on the chromatic differences, the hue, the chickens should be easily able to tell these differences apart. And this is not terribly surprising. But if we look at the achromatic differences and we compare red to white, it's beyond our threshold, same with red to yellow, but yellow and white are below even our more liberal uh, threshold of one just noticeable difference. So what that means is from a bird's eye view, they cannot tell the difference in the brightness between these two signals. So we can conclude that chickens can learn avoidance for all three of these signals, but yellow is most effective in being significantly more so than white, with red being intermediate. And these differences are due to the chicken's ability to discern the colors, but not the, uh, the brightness of these two signals. So going on to chapter two, alkaloid variability in dying poison frog and its importance to predator response. So dendrobatic poison frogs are really cool in that they have this ability to sequester alkaloid toxins from dietary sources. This is evolved at least three, perhaps four different times in this family. And uh, when it's evolved, we see an explosion of color within that clay. Uh, they tend to specialize on ants, mites, millipedes, and beetles as sources of these. Toxins can vary over space and time as the invertebrate communities on which they rely uh, vary over space and time. And this is a mechanism for honest signaling. So honest signaling you can think of as uh, essentially the more conspicuous a signal is, the more um, unpalatable or profitable that, that signal should be. So as these toxins vary over space and time, the signals should vary over space and time in order to keep them honest. But for this particular species, the dying poison frog, no one's actually even looked at the, the most basic understanding of, of alkaloid variability among populations. So for this chapter, I'm uh, asking simply, do the toxins vary uh, between populations of Dendrobates tinctorius? And then of those toxins, what are responsible for predator response? So to characterize alkaloids, we use gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And when we do this, the alkaloids are separated by mass and we get this readout where we have these different peaks. And each peak corresponds to uh, a different alkaloid, which we can individually identify based on the characteristics in the gas chromatography mass spectrometry file. Not only that, but we can also measure how much of that alkaloid is in the sample by measuring the area under the curve of these peaks and then comparing that to an internal standard. So we characterize the alkaloid diversity between two populations, this yellow population, which is from Kaw, and this white population, which is from Missouri. <laughs> now for the behavioral response, however, there's been considerable debate in the literature about toxicity versus unpalatability. Prior, uh, prior research almost exclusively has focused on toxicity. They took these alkaloids, they inject them into the musculature or into the bloodstream, and then uh, assessed the behavioral response of their test subjects. And quite simply, this is not a biologically or evolutionarily relevant way of assessing variability in these alkaloids because these frogs, um, the, the predators of these frogs are not experiencing these alkaloids uh, by injection. They're ingesting these alkaloids. So unpalatability is a much more accurate measure of the evolutionary importance of, of these alkaloids. Now, unfortunately, up until this research, no one has done any <coughs> sort of unpalatability work with uh, these frog alkaloids. So we had to sort of uh, go into untested waters. So what we ended up doing is we would collect skins from these frogs, then we put them in methanol. The alkaloids are uh, soluble in methanol. We take equal proportions of that methanol out that has our alkaloids, it has mucus, it has everything that these frogs are experiencing, or excuse me, the predators are experiencing when they attack these frogs. Then we dry off the methanol, because methanol has uh, toxicity effects. We reconstitute it in ethanol, and then we add that to oats. Um, we allow the ethanol to dry off, and then we, at the end of the day, we have uh, alkaloid-infused oats that we then give to blue tits, uh, which are a common predator for taste trials. So the general setup for this experiment was that we have these two treatments, our yellow treatment and our white treatment. Each bird went through four different trials. The first trial, they received oats that had ethanol put on it, and it was allowed to dry off. This was to ensure that the birds were motivated to eat. And then they went through two trials uh, where they got the alkaloids. And then in trial four, they uh, got another ethanol oat. This was to ensure that uh, they weren't starting to associate the oats with a negative experience and that they were still hungry. We then used uh, the proportions of the oats eaten from both trials two and three uh, as a proxy for unpalatability. Now, 
individual variation in uh, alkaloid profiles uh, within a population, let alone among populations, can be quite high in these frogs. And uh, they can have quite a lot of uh, alkaloids. So an individual might have 20 or 30 different types of alkaloids in its skin. And because of that, we don't have the statistical power to individually assess each individual alkaloid with linear regression to find if it is uh, a good predictor of predator response or not. To get around that, we did a factor analysis, which essentially groups these alkaloids into uh, loadings, and then we did a linear regression based on those loadings. If there's any significant results, that suggests that the uh, loading itself, the alkaloids in the loading, potentially are responsible for predator response. Now we also did a uh, generalized linear mixed model to look at the oak eating speed, the, so the percentage of the oak eaten per second. Uh, we found no difference between these two populations. So getting into the population variation of these alkaloids. So we have two retention plots here. Um, this is just two individuals from each, one from each of the populations, and this is just an example. As I said, there's a lot of individual variation here, but there are a few kind of key points to, to take note of. This 251T alkaloid uh, is very prevalent through, uh, throughout the white population. The 235A alkaloid is also very prevalent in the yellow population. But when we look at the overall population diversity, in the white population, uh, we identified 49 different alkaloids, eight of which were previously undescribed. This uh, represents 11 structural classes. For the yellow population, we recovered, uh, or we, um, we described uh, 46 different alkaloids, uh, eight of which are previously undescribed, representing 12 structural classes. So we also ended up doing a principal components analysis to see if uh, these, these two populations group by their alkaloid profiles. And when we look at the data, it does suggest that there is some grouping, although when we add our 95 confidence uh, uh, interval ellipses, there is a bit of overlap. This is likely due to the 15 alkaloids that are common to both populations, even though uh, each population has a little over 30 that are unique to that population. It's worth noting, too, that there are about 20% of the alkaloids that we found were uh, previously undescribed. Now visually, if we want to look at the distribution of these alkaloids, we can look at this bubble plot, uh, and uh, each circle represents a different alkaloid. The color of the circle represents the structural class of that alkaloid, and the size of the circle represents the proportion of that alkaloid found in the overall pro uh, population profile. So from this, for example, in the yellow population, we can see that 235A alkaloid that I mentioned <coughs> earlier is very prevalent uh, in this population. It also has a great variety of structural classes that, uh, where no particular class seems to dominate. On the other hand, for the white population, we see a very different picture. It's uh, heavily dominated by these blue structural class alkaloids, uh, with this 251T being the most prevalent within that population. Now, as I said, there are 15 alkaloids that were common to both populations, although not in equal proportions. So we can look at this 243A alkaloid, for example, in the white population that's very prevalent, not so much in the yellow population. Likewise for the 235A, very prevalent in yellow, not so much in, in the white. Now when we did our factor analysis, we didn't find any loadings that were significant for the, uh, the yellow population, but we did find two loadings that were significant for the white population, which implicated 16 different alkaloids that may be uh, responsible for predator uh, behavior. Now this is far from a smoking gun, but this helps narrow down those 50 alkaloids to a manageable amount that can uh, then allow for individual testing to see which ones are potentially uh, responsible for predator response. So this research represents the first characterization of among uh, population variation in Dendrobates tinctorius. Of note, the multiple uh, undescribed alkaloids suggest a large diversity yet to be discovered. This not only has implications for um, understanding predator response, but it also has pharmaceutical ed, uh, applications. These alkaloids primarily act on uh, the sodium potassium channels in, in nerve cells and um, have great pain killing uh, potential properties. This also is the first assessment of what toxins may be driving predator behavior. Prior research has focused on the whole profile and this allows us to kind of narrow in on that and uh, try to figure out which toxins are the really important ones. So we do only have uh, two uh, pop data points here with these two populations. We are actively pursuing four more <coughs> populations in the northeastern 
uh, French Guyana region to get alkaloid profiles and behavioral responses uh, to those alkaloids so we can better understand um, what ov overlaps there are, what differences there are, and hopefully through that increased sample size we can um, further narrow down what alkaloids are important for uh, predator selection or predator response. Now going into chapter three, differential responses of avian and mammalian predators uh, to the ventral coloration in Australian brood frogs. This will, will be published in PLOS One tomorrow. So the Australian brood frogs are uh, an Australian endemic genus and they're so named because they have this really neat behavior where males will uh, create uh, call chambers to attract females. Females will come along and lay eggs in that chamber. Males will then guard their eggs, guard the brood, until those chambers flood, and then they'll get out of there and let the eggs finish their development. But what really attracted me to these frogs is that they're highly variable in color. Now this is usually fairly specific to species. There's not a whole lot of uh, within species variation, although for some species, such as this one, it does show considerable within and among population variability. Not only that, but they also, all frogs in this genus have this very conspicuous black and white reticulated venter, um, with the one exception of this guy who adds a little bit more flair to it. Now, uh, so they have conspicuous colors. They also have alkaloids, and they can biosynthesize these alkaloids independent of diet. They're the only fr frogs out there known to be able to do this, but they can also get alkaloids from dietary sources. And there's research that suggests that in absent, uh, in lacking alkaloid, uh, dietary sources, they can upregulate those biosynthesized alkaloids, which suggests that there might not be as much variation within a population, potentially between populations or between species. If that's the case, that has large implications for honest signaling, because if the consequence is fairly uniform across uh, populations or across species, why is the signal uh, not uniform? But that's getting ahead of myself. No one to date has yet uh, looked at the, um, whether these, these signals are actually protective or not. So uh, I want to investigate, uh, are the dorsal, sign dorsal and ventral signals protective? And the ventral signal is of particular note uh, because it's a high contrast signal. It's not a color signal. So while we primarily focus on avian predators for these colors, this high contrast signal might be a signal to uh, mammalian predators, those, to those dichromatic predators. So I further ask, uh, are signals protective against birds and mammals? Now as I showed you just a little bit ago, uh, pseudocamine are spread throughout Australia and they're largely uh, separated into two different groups. We have our eastern group, which is the more diverse group. There's about nine or ten species found in, uh, along the eastern coast of Australia. And then there's the western plates that are found, um, there's only about two or three, or three or four species found in West Australia. <coughs> it's also worth noting that there were really weird species found in the dead center of Australia. I have no idea what's going on there. Um, so, uh, getting into how do we uh, assess how predators view novel colors. And to do this, we created clay models uh, that mimic the, local, the phenotypes found throughout the genus. So we have our brown model, we have one that has flash marks in its armpits, we have our uh, yellow-headed model that has a lot of yellow on its head in your style, as well as the armpits, we have our corroboree model, and then we have our orange-headed model. We also included our, our uh, ventral model as well. Now, in order to make these, what we ended up doing is getting a museum specimen of one of these frogs. We created a 3D print of that to create these silicone molds. We then mold, uh, poured melted clay, not chocolate, um, into these molds to, to make these frogs. After we finished uh, making, uh, pouring the molds, we then painted these models. And this involved painting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these models. And we have to have a large number because these are, um, the predation rates are very low in these, in these sort of experiments. Now I'd like to acknowledge that this, uh, ex this research was funded by the East Asia and Pacific uh, Summer Institutes program, which uh, is offered through the National Science Foundation. All right, so moving on. So to assess predator preferences, we put out 1,200 models of six, to, or just shy of 1,200 models of six different phenotypes. We placed them on transects in random order. They were separated every three meters. Uh, these transects ranged from 750 meters long to 2.1 kilometers long. 
We left them out for one week for predators to attack them. After a week, we collected them, assessed what types of predators attacked them based on the dentition left in the clay, and then we analyzed the results with the G-test of independence. So if we look at our results for our bird predators, uh, we see a suggestion of a trend uh, where the dorsal signals had lower attack rates than our ventral signal. Now, uh, because of our low attack rates and the large number of treatments, we weren't able to statistically tease apart whether uh, individual comparisons were significant for, from one another. Likewise, for our mammal attacks, we, we saw uh, suggestions of a trend, but we weren't able to tease these apart. So to get this around this, what we ended up doing is grouping our dorsal signals together and comparing them to the ventral signal. And this could have some potential negative impacts because there are two uh, phenotypes, this yellow-headed phenotype and the corroborate phenotype, that are uh, novel for this area. And arbitrarily adding them to our dorsal signals might skew our results. So in order to uh, avoid that, we analyzed these results in a couple of different ways. First, we looked at um, just the local forms that were found in the Wadigans area and compared that to the ventral form. And then we saw for birds, it was a significant result where they're significantly more likely to attack that ventral form than any of the dorsal forms. We saw no difference for mammals. Uh, if we look at all the dorsal phenotypes and compare it to uh, the local or the, the uh, ventral phenotype, we see the same trend. <coughs> A uh, very significant difference in birds, not so much in mammals. If we just look at the local conspicuous one, we see the same trend. And then if we look at just the novels, again, we see, see the same trend. So what we can c conclude from this is the dorsal signals are deterrents of avian predators, and they may be generalizing the signal. We weren't able to fully confirm this. I think our data is suggestive of that, but it warrants further investigation. The ventral signals, however, do, do not appear to deter avian predators. For mammals, uh, the dorsal and ventral signals are equal. And by that, I mean they're either equally effective or equally ineffective. The design of this experiment was not able to discern which. But this represents the first assessment of the protective value of pseudophrenic coloration out there. And perhaps does provide support for the idea that these colors may be aposematic in function. So finally, chapter four, weak warning signals can persist in the absence of gene flow. This has to do with the dying poison frog, Dendrobates tinctorius. This is a really neat species because it is uh, highly polytypic. Each one of these frogs scrolling through represents a uh, distinct population found throughout the Guyana Shield in northern, northern South America. So this amount of variation in color begs the question of how can polytypism evolve? In order to tackle this, uh, we focused our efforts in French Guyana, specifically northeastern French Guyana, where again we're working with the, mature, the white maturity population and the yellow uh, caw population. I'm just going to continue to call these white and yellow. And the first thing that we did was determine relationships between these two populations. And in order to do that, we did a DNA rat seek to identify polymorphic loci found throughout the genome of Dendrobates tinctorius. We ended up identifying 1,500 single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, spread throughout the genome, and we used a program called GFOX, which uh, stands for Generalized Phylogenetic Coalescence Sampler. And among other things, it can calculate the migration rates between the populations going from white to yellow or yellow to white. And we found extremely low mi migration rates, less than 0 .0001. And essentially what we can take from this is that these two populations are virtually uh, completely isolated from one another. They're not exchanging alleles with one another. Now, you're probably looking at these, these frogs and noticing that they are fairly similar. They have the same pattern, and even these white frogs don't appear to be purely white. They kind of look beige in color. But if we look at the spectral reflectance data, we can see that these are distinctly different colors. So what we have here are two, two different populations that are similar in pattern, different in color, and they're not exchanging alleles. So this allows us some interesting opportunities to be able to examine uh, expectations for polymorphism and polytypism. So the first thing that we did was look at strength and direction of natural selection using, using the same models again. We created 1,300 models of four different phenotypes. We put them on transects, uh, again, randomly ordered. The transects ranged from half a kilometer up to 1.5 kilometers long. We left them there for three days, after which we collected them and uh, stored what sort of predators attacked them. Because we're dealing with color signals here, we we're solely focused on uh, the avian predators. We didn't uh, focus on the mammalian predators at all. We then analyzed these results with a G-test of independence as well. So the general setup for the white area is we had uh, a 
white stripe model, yellow stripe model, and a solid white model. This represents <coughs> local color, local pattern, novel color, local pattern, and then local color, novel pattern. And the purpose of having this sort of setup was to have at least one aspect of the signal, be it color or pattern, that was familiar to the <coughs> predators. Likewise, in the yellow population, we had yellow stripes, white stripes, and solid yellow. When we recovered our models, we were looking for attacks that were similar to this. These U or V-shaped marks, as well as these stabbing marks, were indicative of bird attacks. So if we get into our results, in the white population, we recovered about 1,100 models. And we saw this distribution of attacks. This was a significant result, which then allows us to look at pairwise comparisons between the local white striped form and our two novel forms. And when we look at white stripes compared to yellow stripes, there's no difference. But when we look at white stripes compared to, um, excuse me, the white stripes compared to solid white, no difference. Uh, and if we look at white stripes compared to yellow stripes, there is a difference. In the yellow population, uh, we recovered about 1,300 models. We saw no difference in uh, the amount of attacks between the three model types. Now the nice thing about this setup is we can look at a pattern irrespective of color and vice versa. So if we look at pattern, be it stripes or solids, we saw no difference in either area in the proportion of attacks uh, uh, for, from predators. However, if we look at color, we do see a significant difference in the white area where white colored models were significantly more likely to be attacked by predators than the yellow models. We didn't see any difference in the yellow uh, population. So if you've been following along, these results should really confuse you. Because uh, if stabilizing selection is a, a factor here, uh, the local form, yellow striped uh, models in the yellow striped form should receive the lowest predation pressure. The two novel forms should be protected or should be removed from the, the population. We did not see that in either of these populations. So in order to uh, try to investigate what was going on here, we did uh, learning and generalization experiments with chickens. We had four different treatments. Each treatment had a color signal, either yellow or white and a chloroquine concentration difference, either a 5% chloroquine concentration or a 10% chloroquine concentration, to make those mealworms palatable. It was the same sort of setup as before. They would go through 10 trials uh, that they were exposed to these, these petri dishes with unpalatable mealworms. If they learned to avoid the signal, uh, which was three refusals in a row, uh, they then went on to a generalization experiment where they were exposed to the opposite signal. So if they successfully learned to avoid yellow, they were then uh, exposed to white and vice versa. We analyzed these results with a uh, uh, generalized linear model. So I want to show you an example of uh, chicken learning. And this is a chick that I've come to fondly know as chick number 39. And uh, this is four consecutive trials in this chick. So you can kind of see how the behavior changes over time. And what you're going to notice is uh, very quickly in the first two trials, essentially once it sees that mealworm, it attacks it. But come trial three, you can almost see the cogs turning in its head. It's really thinking hard about attacking that mealworm. It's starting to associate that signal with unpalatability. And after nearly a minute of resisting, it finally breaks down and attacks it. Um, but come trial four, it wants absolutely nothing to do with that mealworm. It goes to the full five minute trial completely avoiding the mealworm, and this chick ended up going on to learn to avoid that signal. So getting into the results for this, the effects of secondary uh, defense on uh, response, uh, if we look at latency to attacks, or the hesitation time, or the number of attacks, or the number of trials in which the chick actually attacked a mealworm, we see a really interesting uh, color by chloroquine uh, interaction. So birds that were uh, in the yellow treatment that were exposed to a high chloroquine hesitated significantly longer uh, and attacked significantly less than those exposed uh, to white in the high treatment. So what this suggests is that a, an effective signal can be further enhanced by a stronger secondary defense, but a weak signal cannot be recovered from a stronger second, secondary defense. So going into the data for uh, if they learned or not, we saw this distribution, which was a significant result, where the birds that were exposed to yellow were significantly more likely to learn to avoid that signal than those exposed to white. All the birds that successfully learned their signal then went on to generalization where they're exposed to the opposite signal. And we saw this distribution where those that had learned on yellow were significantly more likely to avoid the first instance of a novel signal than those that had learned on white. <coughs> now finally, we also wanted to look at secondary defenses. And as I said before, no one's really looked at unpalatability in an a, in empirical way. And uh, because we're in uncharted waters, we decided to do two different assays. So we took those methanol extracts that I talked about earlier, 
and we uh, dried off that methanol, we weighed the resulting dry mass of all the contents that were left, so those alkaloids, the mucus, uh, the uh, peptides, everything that the predators would experience, then we reconcentrated it in ethanol uh, such that the concentrations were the same uh, across each individual. Then we put that on oats, uh, we allowed it to dry off so we had alkaloid infused oats again. And then uh, we had actually three treatments for this, uh, this setup. We had our yellow and white treatments as well as control. Just like before, they went through four trials where the first and last trials, they had control ethanol oats. The, uh, trials two and three, they were exposed to the, um, the toxins. And then this time we used beak wiping and the proportion of oats eating, eaten as a proxy for distastefulness. We analyzed these results with the generalized uh, linear mixed model. Uh, and we used trials two and three specifically uh, for, for that analysis. Now the second acid that we did, rather than equal concentrations, we looked at equal proportions. So, so we took off equal proportions of that uh, methanol extract, we dried it down, and then reconstituted it in half a mil of ethanol, regardless of what that dry mass was, then went through the same process. We added it to oats, allowed the ethanol to dry off, and then uh, gave them to, to these blue tits to assess their behavior. Now it is worth noting that these birds really do not like these alkaloids. So this is an example of a bird that just tried one of the oats. This head shaking behavior is a common uh, sign of disgust in these birds. So getting into our results, how palatable are these frogs? So looking at the concentrations, we saw an interesting uh, 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 effect. So there's no difference in the proportion eaten between these three treatments, but in the beak wiping, we did see a significant difference between yellow uh, and uh, white in the uh, control, uh, but there's no difference between white and the control themselves. For the proportions assay, we also saw some kind of some interesting results where yellow was uh, eaten uh, significantly slower than our controls. Uh, it was not different from white, uh, and white was not different from the control. And then uh, for the beak wiping, yellow and white did not differ from one another, but they did differ from the control. So what this suggests is that the non-toxin content, those, that mucus, those uh, peptides, everything that the predators are experiencing except the alkaloids, has a potentially diluting effect uh, in the white population, which makes them <coughs> more palatable to predators. Now I already showed you these profiles and the distribution of alkaloids in these, these populations, but I want to draw your attention to the mean quantity of alkaloids for frogs. And this is really interesting because they're so different between these two populations. I did test this with the Van Whitney U test. Uh, these are different from one another, which is likely due to our uh, small sample size, as well as the wide variation seen in the white population. But it's worth noting that uh, the means between these two populations are considerably different from one another, with the white population having almost twice the amount of alkaloids as the yellow population. So this suggests that it's not the mean quantity that is important for a predator response, but it's perhaps a subset of alkaloids, as I showed in chapter two. So tying this all together, Wright uh, proposed back in the 1930s an idea of an adaptive landscape. And uh, essentially, you can think of a landscape as a series of adaptive peaks. And we expect that a selection should drive a population up an adaptive peak to an adaptive optimum for local conditions. Once a population is at that peak, it should be difficult for a population to go from one peak to another because it has to go down an adaptive gradient, essentially into a maladaptive valley, to cross to another peak. Now, while this animation is probably overly simplistic, realistically, it's probably something more like this, where each one of these peaks likely represents a different population, a different phenotype of these, these frogs. It's worth noting, too, that uh, these aren't necessarily at their adaptive optimum. They could still be climbing these peaks. But what this research from this chapter suggests is that some peaks may be particularly isolated from one another. Um, because, due to limited gene flow. And if that's the case, you could have a weak signal, such as that white signal, persist despite all its selective disadvantages. Not only that, but we also provide evidence that um, a signal that is easily learned and broadly generalized can allow for novel signals to arise and persist within a population, which then as populations shift over time, they can go on to colonize new areas and climb their own individual adaptive peaks. So finishing up with conclusions and selections for uh, polytypism, um, I think what uh, this dissertation shows is a, a potential path for speciation in aposematic species. So if we have two populations that 
are monomorphic, uh, and novel phenotypes were to arise within either of these, we would expect in a population that has reduced on palatability, the signals are not easily learned, and they're not broadly generalized, that novel signals would not persist very well within them. However, in a population that has high palatability, uh, the signals are easily learned and they evoke broad generalization, these novel signals can persist. And then they could be allowed to uh, expand across a, a landscape. And then through stochastic processes, these populations can become isolated from one another, uh, leading to uh, isolation and reduced gene flow, allowing them to climb their own individual adaptive peaks, which is likely the first uh, uh, precursor to speciation. Now, I want to note that this is not a uh, frog-specific phenomenon. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, we have uh, the Helconius butterflies, we have salamanders, salamanders, we have the, the motilid wasps, the, the velvet ants that show considerable within and among population variation in phenotypic signal. And what this dissertation uh, helps explain is how we can go from a monomorphic population onto a polymorphic population and ultimately a polytypic species <coughs> uh, speciation. So I think there's one final conclusion uh, before I, I wrap this up here that my research can also help, uh, help elucidate. Um, and that is given its uh, conspicuous coloration and its very distasteful uh, secondary compounds without a doubt Type pods are aplosmatic and should not be <laughs> So, with that, I have many people to thank, including my committee, Bryce Noonan, Colin Jackson, Ryan Garrick, uh, Becky Smula, and John Lomaldi. I have a ton of collaborators to thank and field assistants for all their help. I would not have been able to do all this work without their help. In particular, I want to call out uh, Viviana Rojas for all her aid in the Tinctorious uh, research. I'd like to thank the, the Noonan Lab, both past and present, for um, accepting me into their lab, as well as the biology grad students in the back here, uh, for allowing me to bounce ideas off of you, and the University of Mississippi for giving me the opportunity to pursue this research. And finally, the uh, University of Newcastle and Western Sydney University for hosting me when I was in Australia, and uh, my funding sources, the CNR SAVA program, the ASA Education Award, the SSAR grant in herpetology, the Strike Short Fellowship, uh, the National Science uh, Foundation, East Asia Pacific Summer Institute, the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Department of Education and Training, and the University of Mississippi. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah, Rich. I, you lost me when you started talking about generalization. Could, could you tell me again how you did that? So when we had uh, chickens that uh, learned to avoid the signal, and we defined that as three refusals in a row, um, they then went on to a separate experiment where we, they, we exposed them to the opposite signal. All right? So if they learned to avoid yellow, um, they, went, uh, they were then exposed to a signal they had not seen before, in this case, white. And we, if they avoided that in the first instance of that novel signal, we said that they generalized to a novel signal. If they um, if they did not avoid it, we said they, they did not generalize. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, sorry, just one more um, Are you concerned about the interpretation of the clay model bites when they lack the multimodality that's used by predators and usually attract uh, attacking prey? So that for instance, there's no motion associated with it. So there has been some research done before on uh, motion with clay models. There's uh, one of my collaborators actually put uh, these models on clocks and put on the second hand to essentially simulate motion. They did find that that did increase attack rates, but it didn't change the overall conclusions. So the the, um, the aposematic forms were detected and the non-aposematic forms for that particular study were attacked. Okay, to follow that up, did you ever observe the predators? So um, that's one of the things that's difficult with this uh, particular system is that we're not entirely sure what the predators are. So there are a number of different bird species uh, for the Tinctoria system, um, such as tinamous and watmots uh, that are, are likely candidates uh, for, for uh, being predators of these frogs. But the, the amount of 
predation records that have been observed in dendrobatids, I think I can count on one hand. Yeah. So that, that, that's sort of my point, is one of the things I just want to follow with is, um, does anything change if you were to observe your models? Would anything change if you discovered that they were all forgivers words that were pecking at the, the models? I don't think so, because even if um, these were forgivers birds, presumably when they come across a, a real frog, they would have the same sort of thought process. These frogs in particular, these tinctorious, they don't move a whole lot. Like, they'll just sit there. Uh, and so if a forgivers bird were to come along and try to attack it, it would still essentially go through the same thought process. This is conspicuous. Is this a fruit or not? Oh, it turns out that it's distasteful. I'm not going to touch anything that looks like this. So in the previous studies that you were talking about, was there any distinction in the rate of attacks with motion um, applied to the models and without motion? In other words, without motion, do you get a greater frequency of fruit-eating bird attacks? Yeah, they didn't, uh, they didn't specify down to the, the type of bird. Um, as you, you saw in the, the two models that I showed, the, the ones that are attacked are kind of destroyed. And the best we can really do is, is try to look for that U or V-shaped mark. Occasionally, we might see some serrations that might indicate like a matma, but it's very, very difficult to identify what type of bird is, is attacking the, the models. It's, I just bring this up because uh, when I was on OTS, we put out models, mm -hmm. and a friend and myself observed the birds. He was the bird guy, mm -hmm. and they were all forgivers birds. And he just kind of said, what does that mean? That none of these are going, going to eat frogs. Right, right. So I, I mean, I think that's a fair criticism. Um, and it's, I, I think it's just a, one of the limitations of these sort of thing models is because you can't specifically target these, these potential candidate birds. Uh, ideally, we'd be able to collect the, the birds and then show them frogs and see whether or not they, they would attack them. Um, but realistically, uh, doing that is, is basically feasible. Any questions? Chastin. So I have a question about the, uh, about the brood frog um, stuff, mm -hmm. uh, specifically with regard to the ventral coloration. Um, I was just wondering why mammals, I mean, uh, I'm just having a tough time imagining a mammal that can see the underside of a frog. So that's that's a good question. So when these these frogs are disturbed, in my personal experience looking from a lot of these frogs, they sort of freeze. And um, they're they're usually they kind of hide in the leaf litter. So what I imagine is likely happening is um, you have birds like the, the brush turkeys or um, lyre birds that are scratching through and they might scratch up one of these frogs and they could either see the ventral or the dorsal side. Same thing with these, these mammals um, where we have these little uh, carnivorous uh, carnivorous mammal or marsupials in Australia that might be sifting through the leaf litter and accidentally flip one of these frogs up and when they're flipped upside down they're not exactly quick to, to right themselves. Yeah, Jessica. I know of at least one of two species, the fire belly toad, that that's its Does it response. Up? Do they do the same thing? Not, uh, not that I have observed. They don't do really do that that one can reflex. They just kind of freeze. Stephanie. So I have the same general question. But my question was: Is it possible that the birds chose to? Because is it right? Am I getting it right that you had more attacks on the ventral pattern? Mm -hmm. The birds were like, that frog's sitting still, it's belly up, it's it's easy pickings, and then they just went in. I mean it's yeah. entire it's entirely possible. Um, I don't know what birds think, so I can't <laughs> I, I can't if I were a bird I'd be like that frog. Yeah, yeah. No, I it, it's entirely possible. Yeah. Jason? Uh, I have two questions. So just going off what everyone was just talking about, what about fish? Do they ever float in water where they no, breathe? They're, so these, these frogs are completely terrestrial and okay. um, they, prior to the rainy season, they'll construct these call chambers uh, next to vernal pools yeah. and wait till those vernal pools flood. Okay, gotcha. All right, and the second question was um, with tinctorious. So you have these two different types that have different alkaloid content, right? Mm -hmm. But it's all um, sequestered from diet, right? Mm -hmm. So is it 
that they're sequestering different things from the same prey, or do they have different prey between the That's something that we're looking into right now. Uh, I can't tell you. I, I don't know. My, my guess is that they have different prey, but um, yeah. That's, yeah, that's something that we're looking into. Lucille? I want to just follow up. My, my question was kind of that, but it was, if, I wonder if you would see, if you would see differences over, uh, over a year or seasonality associated with their toxins because their diet could yep. potentially change yep. throughout the year. Yep. So, um, there, like I said, there are they, these toxins can vary over space and time. No one's done a, a time series kind of like year by year or even month by month <coughs> to see how these alkaloids change. Um, but there have been people that have looked at historical uh, collections and found that, like for example, in La Selva and Costa Rica, um, you have large differences over a 30 year period between populations that occurred there. So it's entirely possible, but um, it's, it's uh, rather difficult to, to really assess that just given the amount of individual variation within a population uh, to actually kind of follow these trends. But so, you get, so you can get the toxins out of, uh, out of, uh, this, out of um, museum collections? So I, I'm I'm not entirely sure how they did it, but I, I, yeah, they, I, I think I don't know if they were using. I, I'd have to go back to that. That's their paper. I can't remember if they were using museum collections or if they were using um, prior samples that were collected by early researchers, because um, the interest in alkaloid toxins in these frogs has been going on since the late '60s. Um, so it might be that these these early researchers had a bunch of alkaloids on on stock essentially. Uh, Tim. Yeah. So the tinctorious older so there's two things, one that aren't really related. So one is I thought that chickens were just predispositioned to learn to tell of, of neophobia. Um, and uh, yeah, the birds in general are more sensitive to longer wavelengths, which perhaps explains why when you look at the vast array of Epos Max signals, you see lots of reds, oranges, and yellows. Okay, yeah, that's just... Um, and then with the tinctories of different populations, there's not much variation in color or pattern within populations, right? Depends on the population. There are some populations where you'll get individuals that look like these striped yellow ones, and right next to it, you can have individuals that have a completely solid yellow back. Yeah, so if this signal, like, if there's a general, like, aposematic color or hue that works, but then sexual selection is further driving, you know, fine-tuning, mm -hmm. wouldn't you expect basically what you see? Like, can it be both? It could be. Yeah, so there, there has been um, implications of sexual selection driving phenotypic diversity in a related species of Ophaga familio and <coughs> Um, but for this particular species, well, for that species, uh, there are a few notable differences. Uh, it's an obligate egg feeder, so there's a considerable maternal investment. So it's thought that um, females need to be very choosy of, of males. So uh, having a, a bright signal might allow them to be choosy. For these ones, there's no, no such investment, and um, they almost have a reversal uh, of, of their sexual characteristics. Because in, in the Panamanian frogs, uh, the males are, like most frogs, they're, they're calling their hearts out trying to attract these, these females. Where in uh, Tinctorius, it's actually the females that are, are kind of chasing males. It's, uh, in captivity, you can kind of observe, that, or observe this, that females will just hop around and chase these males and harass these males until they finally uh, acquiesce. So it's, there could be, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it, there could be uh, sexual selection going on, and that's something certainly that I would like to kind of extend upon, but um, I don't know that anyone's really, from this particular species, looked into it too, too in depth. Yeah, Bill. So you sort of presaged my question by measuring neophobia. Um, you, were, you were talking about the idea that um, it's hard for a new morph to establish a new population because of the strength of selection. Mm -hmm. Because of the sampling issue, mm -hmm. not sampling that. But if there's neophobia involved, yep. there's a possible explanation why that where you may get uh, advantage, like rare advantage, yep. rare advantage, um, if they do have some experience with this. Yeah. So it, it could be um, it could be kind of a coupled effect with, with what I what I observed. 
such that um, essentially if you have a signal that uh, evokes easy learning and broad generalization, maybe the predators are actually uh, more neophobic. Like they tried this, this one frog, they have a bad experience, and then they're like, I don't want to touch anything that looks like this. Um, that could be what's going on, and it's really difficult to kind of tease that apart, but that's certainly a possible explanation. So, uh, I just had a question about the, uh, uh, the reasoning behind combining trials two and three. Was that because of sample size, or did so we did look at the differences between trials two and three? Um, so, we, we did use, um, like for, for the, uh, for the, the, the both the, the taste where we had the beak wiping and the amount of portion of the oats eaten, uh, we incorporated trials two and three separately into our model. Um, and in the, uh, the other other one where we're just looking at proportion, um, that certainly, I, I just combined those two to come up with a mean proportion eaten, but it's certainly possible to, uh, to look I guess at. the reason I'm asking is, um, just based on uh, one data point has supposed that uh, chick 39, where by trial, I guess that was by trial four. Anyway, um, I wonder if uh, trial three would have given you a stronger. But this, keep, keep on, this is different. Signal. This is, uh, so the, the chick experiments, yeah, the blue tit experiments it's were different. different. Uh, so, like, the, for the, the blue tit experiments, we were um, specifically focused on um, a response independent of a color signal. So we just wanted them to eat oats and respond. So yeah, it's entirely possible if we went on three trials, four trials, five trials, um, we might have seen uh, increased uh, behavior. Um, and uh, But at that point, we, we run risks of satiation uh, in these birds and um, that they might start associating these oats with a negative experience. So essentially, we, we, we don't want to risk that, which is kind of why we focused on the, the few trials. Yeah, Jason. Um, <clears throat> so these are these are not lethal. They're just very distasteful. For these these particular frogs, yes. So there are frogs that are lethal, though, right? Yep. Um, so how exactly does that evolve? Because it doesn't give the chance for predators. So to one learn. of the, the uh, hypotheses is social learning. So um, you, one of the ideas is that birds are often like in flocks, and you'll have one bird attack this uh, this unpalatable this this deadly organism. They have a negative experience. They drop dead. All their buddies are like, "Crap, don't do that again." Um, I'm not going to touch that. So there has been some evidence that um, these these uh, birds can learn to avoid signals without having to even touch the signals based on their observations of their their conspecifics. Are there any that are like tolerant of the toxins? So, not to my knowledge for birds, but there are. Um, uh, there are some interesting arms races with actually that, that deadly species that I was mentioning with, um, I believe, some snakes and some wolf spiders that, that are pretty tolerant to the, the, the aquaids. Any other questions? All right, All right thank, thank you very much. much.